Hi guys, well we are getting closer to finishing Sarah or Elizabeth's story. Today we're going to get a little bit more perspective of how she felt about all of the things she was angry about during her life. And she'll tell us how all of this time, her being in her very late 90s, helped her have a change of heart about certain things. And then there's other things she talks about that she's still pretty stubborn on and is willing to take that to the grave with her and deal with it in the next life. <laughs> so um, we're going to see some more of her witty humor and learn some more about the culture at that time in regards to polygamy and those who were opposed to it. And then she's going to tell us how her husband, Thomas Whitaker, died. So are you ready? Let's get reading. Chapter 28. She was getting more frail each day, or so it seemed to me. Yet she talked of days gone by as though she were reliving them. So many things, it's hard to put them down in sequence. Here are some of them. Dear Sister Frankie Randall, I loved that woman. Now you tell me she's gone too. When will my turn come, I wonder? When will my turn come, I wonder? George, trying to read his law book, yet dutifully pretending to listen with one ear, just putting a word in here and there so she'd feel she had an audience. But then, suddenly, he asked her a question on his pet subject, the word of wisdom. Old Bishop Randall was a fine man and kept the word of wisdom, didn't he? He knew very well that he did, but was teasing Grandma, who was sometimes a little too outspoken in her own reasoning. Yes, in disgust. The old so-and-so didn't have a real good sense of taste on what was good for a person at all. He just wasn't refined enough, in my opinion, especially a woman who just had a baby or illness of some kind. He just couldn't appreciate the common sense in having a cup of tea when necessary. A lot of difference between him and President Joseph F. Smith. But then I told you, didn't I, about him and his old aunt? But Frankie, his wife, was different, refined in every sense of the word. She had her tea just the same whether he liked it or not, and he couldn't do a darn thing about it. Then she went on to another subject. You know, I never bought anything on time, charging it, I mean, in my life. I don't believe in getting things that way. If I wanted something, I began saving for it. I had two boxes. One was a little round box. I called it the world. I kept what I needed for household needs in that. The other was a little square box in which I saved my money for what I wanted terribly at the time. I never would take it out or borrow on it. You know, I even saved enough to buy me an organ. It took almost seven years, but I did it. If any of my sons or sons-in-law gave me a whole dollar or two, or if I could sell a knitted beaded purse that I'd made, or a point lace handkerchief or two, or even a Battenberg lace curtain I'd made, or a door panel, all of handmade lace with braid, you buy especially for that work. You buy especially for that work, and lace stitches made with special fine linen thread. Lasted a lifetime if properly cared for, and few then could even do it. But I loved to. I'd always put some of it, if not all, into the square box. You see, after T.W. broke up both of my looms, I had no way of earning by weaving. Anyway, when my expense money in the round box was gone, I could say, Now I haven't a cent in the world. And then she added, It helped, too, sometimes. When I first started this and the younger children were still at home, unmarried, when they'd come to borrow a dollar or more, I never let them know about the other box, nor what they stood for. I could say if the expense money was all gone, sorry, but I haven't a cent in the world today. I call that really clever, Grandma, I said. I didn't want to lie, and I didn't want to start borrowing from my savings. Sometimes the children, well-meaning as they were, weren't always as anxious to pay back what they borrowed, as they were to borrow it. This way, no one was hurt, and I could feel all right about it. Then she laughed and said, Do you know what your husband George said to me today? No, what? He said I looked young enough to pass for 75 or younger, but I think he had some of my blind stages when he looked in my direction. 
Of late, she is very hard of hearing. This morning she asked me if they had all gone to school. Her desire was to sneak quietly into the bathroom and empty her own chamber pot without being seen by any of the family. She called it the Thunder Mug. Good name for it, too. In those days, we kept one in every bedroom under the bed. They were large, round, very thick china or glazed earthen receptacles with a handle, sort of shaped like a teacup, and would hold some three quarts capacity. Each had a heavy white lid to match. Soon as she was dressed each morning, she'd peek out of her bedroom door to ascertain if the coast was clear. Then she'd dive out of her room and make a bee line for the bathroom with her burden. Sometimes if my father came along, which he often did quite early in the morning, she'd retreat backwards, trying to hide the object with her apron, ostrich fashion, which never quite did the trick. It was an obsession with her to attend to this necessary chore first thing every morning. I told her, all clear now, but Emily, in a loud voice, so she could hear. Oh, Henry, I didn't know you had one named Henry. No, I said Emily. Oh, Mamie, what's she doing here this early, I wonder? Then, where's your husband? He's gone to the garage, I called back. Well, well, I didn't know he was a Freemason. He isn't. What makes you say that? Didn't you say he'd gone to the lodge? One of her sons-in-law, Uncle Ben Rollins, brought her a bottle of wine at Christmas time. She was very pleased and used it most sparingly, using only about two thimbles full at a time, when she was feeling very chilly or not so well. One evening, when she sat feeling dejected, I brought her some in a tiny, thin little glass. It was along in March. Here's the very last of your wine, Grandma, I told her. Well, well, gone already, is it? So, it's all gone. Yes, this finishes it up. As she took tiny sips. Well, I can do with that. Well, I can do with it, or without it, if I have to. But it has a way of picking me up, sort of, if you know what I mean. Later that evening, as I was giving her a bath, prior to tucking her in, she said, My, ain't water a blessing? I don't know what in the world we'd ever do without it. But on the other hand, there's death in it, just as there's death in most everything we use. Did you ever think of that? No, I never did. But how do you mean? Well, there's death in water, death in fire, death in overeating, and also in starvation. There's death in too much heat, too much cold, too much sun. Next day, Sister Coombs came to see her they were very dear friends. I caught only snatches of their conversation as I worked in the kitchen. Grandma was saying, I felt so bad when I couldn't go, but I couldn't hear if I did go. Most that die now are my lifelong friends, but not so old as I am. I guess I'm the oldest one left. I remember hearing one man say to his wife, When I die, I want you to bury me face down. Why? she asked. Because I want to see where I'm going. Oh, I see. You want to see when you get to hell. Perhaps, he answered. Sometimes I prepared her a special lunch and took it to her on a tray so she could eat leisurely and look out the window if she wished. Here's your lunch, Grandma, as she sat staring out the window. She didn't seem to hear me. There's some baked potato there, too. You should eat before it gets cold, I shouted. Well, it's there whether it gets cold or not, isn't it? But it's nice and hot now there under your toast, I spoke mildly. Yes, I'm in the same spot. Where else should I be? When Aunt Eva visited her from California, I wish you'd speak louder. I can't hear a word you're saying. Ain't it a shame? I can't see very well either. Aunt Eva, well, you never could see very well for years and years. Yes, but I can't see as well now as I used to. My father came in just as she was eating breakfast one morning. What's this? I find you drinking coffee again? Aren't you ashamed of yourself? No, I'm not. I can look anyone in the face and say I'm not ashamed. It's a penalty I'll have to pay for myself, and whatever it is, I'll pay it. If there is one, he added. Yes, if there is one. I doubt whether there is one or not. Reminds me of old Sister Parrish when she said, I'm fasting this morning. I only ate one egg one hot biscuit, and one cup of coffee. Grandma then went on with, But I never gave one of my children a cup of tea or coffee, 
even when they needed it, or so I thought, because he didn't want me to, all the while they were growing up, so I didn't. Tell me more about your life in polygamy, Grandma. She mused a moment, then began. I think, all told, I've had a fairly happy life, all things considered. I detested polygamy, every minute of it, for myself, for myself, but realized now it was more my fault than his, once we were in it. He was always good to me. He was very good to the children. He surely loved each one and set them a very good example, better than I did sometimes. I was always too outspoken and sometimes not too diplomatic, but I got along well with all my in-laws. By that I mean sons and daughters-in-law. My children were my joy. Yes, and also my sorrow. I never ever hoped that one of them would become great or prominent, a president or anything like that. All I prayed for was that they all would be honest and behave so I could keep them out of jail. And I did. None of them was ever arrested or accused of any crime whatsoever that I know of. But my oldest and my youngest, they were both such good sons to me, but alcohol ruined their lives in many ways and made it so terribly hard for their families. They each in turn just got into bad company and it made brutes out of them when they were under the influence. But you did resent grandfathers going into polygamy with all my heart and soul. But now I'm old and look back on it. I see Hannah, I see Hannah too bore him eight fine children. Every one of them grew up, married and had families and were fine citizens. None of them would have been on this earth today had he not taken another wife. So I admit the long-sighted wisdom of it all though it was terrible on the poor helpless women folk who had to accept the law many just as unwilling as i was to be perfectly fair most of the plural wives had it harder than the first wife i saw for myself how some of them were abused and how they hated each other so did their children i don't know even now how they came through it all as well as they did more than one plural wife had murder in her heart toward the other wife some, I know, even tried it. Put poison in the tea, for one thing. How about the manifesto? I asked. It came too late to do me any good. When the Congress of the United States declared and enacted forbidding plural marriage, President Wilford Woodruff, then the president of the church, issued the manifesto. I think it is dated 24th of September, 1890. You can read it for yourself. It's in the Doctrine and Covenants very last two pages, if I remember correctly. I know the vote to sustain it was unanimous. You see, up until that time, there was no written law in the United States against plural marriage, and Congress enacted one. When that was done, the church complied at once. Remember our 12th article of faith, we believe in being subject to kings, presidents, rulers, and magistrates, in obeying, honoring, and sustaining the law. I think I've told you that before but it has always been a subject very close to my heart and won't hurt to be repeated. Yes, I think, take it all in all, I've had a pretty happy life. I know this. I've made most of my own trouble. Most of us do, I believe. How, Grandma? Oh, just stewing away in one's mind over things, especially things that can't be helped or changed, imagining things that never happened, fearing they might. Then her mind seemed to revert back to her marriage. I always called my husband T.W. or T. Whitaker, or sometimes Father, when the children were little. His name was Thomas William. I never cared for the name Thomas for a man. Just doesn't appeal to me. My first husband was William, and we called him Will, so he wouldn't let me call him Will. Don't think I would have wanted to anyway. Then, turning to her five-year-old Regal, my youngest, who loved helping her thread her needle, etc., she called him her eyes. Sunny boy, see if you can find my scissors. I had them a minute ago. I don't lose them. They just get away from me somehow. I just can't half see anymore. Her mind wandered back to her own beloved Walty, youngest of her brood of six boys and six girls. I had just given her a nice hot bath and was braiding her hair after washing it in preparation of some hoped-for company that may or may not come calling. Walty said he'd be down to see me today. 
Well, maybe he will, and maybe he won't. He's a good boy, and a smart boy. If only he'd let that alcohol alone. But I guess he never will until he dies, or until it kills him. It's robbed him of his manhood, and his good humor, and made a brute out of him at times, just as it did my will. Oh dear, but I can't help it. I just can't help it. They're both so good fundamentally. He, Walty, I mean, ran away when he was so young. I couldn't stop him. I tried. Oh, how hard I tried. I begged him not to go, but he was determined. He wanted to see the world, to travel. He was just a kid, a boy. He went away. None of us could persuade him not to. He got into bad, rough company, who got him to smoke and then to drink. But he's honest anyway, honest as the day is long. He never tried to beat anyone out of anything, paid his honest debts was well-liked, especially after he joined the Navy. And he's been so good to me. He got $15 a month while in the service, and he sent me five of that every single month. I prodded her a bit. I prodded her a bit farther. But what about you and Grandpa and polygamy? Weren't you going to tell me something about the underground? Oh, yes. You know, of course, that the whole country condemned the church for the practice of polygamy long before the new law was passed forbidding it. The outsiders, non-church members, would hunt the men down and sometimes beat them, even tar and feather them. That was a dreadful thing. They'd build a fire, a huge bonfire, melt the tar in a large iron pot over the flames, then smear the hot tar over the naked body of the victim, rip open a feather pillow and roll him in the feathers, then release him. Some were so badly burned by the hot tar eating into their flesh that they almost died. It was terribly hard to get that stuff off the man once this happened to him. That sort of thing happened more often while we were still in Missouri and Ohio. But there were a few times they did it here too, though they never did it to your grandpa. But they did hunt the men of Centerville down a time or two that I remember. If they could get their hands on a polygamous man, they abused him, beat him, tortured him, and tormented him all they dared. There was no law that would punish these men, who were seldom if ever caught anyway. Usually they weren't permanent residents, or they were apostates, trouble seekers who enjoyed seeing others suffer, then disappeared. That's why many of the better homes built secret panels leading to secret rooms through secret panels. That way they could hide within a few seconds' notice. The William Streeper home, just a half mile north of us, was one of these. We didn't have one in our house, but T.W. cut a door in the wall, leading into another room. Then he put a tall, heavy cupboard against the door to hide it. The closest he ever came to being caught was when one of the older boys came running in to warn him they had spotted two men dressed in black suits, headed in our direction. T.W. rushed to the cupboard, succeeded in moving it to one side, and squeezed through the door, trying to pull it shut after him. But his coat got caught in the narrow opening, and he left it, fleeing northward to the streepers, barely escaping the men. Will and Sam, hurriedly using all their strength, succeeded in pushing the cupboard back, partly into place, while I grabbed the broom and pretended to be sweeping behind the cupboard. When the men were gone, I sat down and laughed, partly from relief and partly because it was so funny. Still, I was certainly glad he got away safely. But Will and Sam could see nothing at all to laugh at and told me so. They were scared to death for fear their father would be caught and tortured. But I knew, once he got safely out of the house, he'd make it to the streepers and be safe. How long were you married to him before he died, Grandma? I asked. Twenty-eight years. The first eleven turned out to be pretty good. I was happy. But the last seventeen, I endured and made what happiness I could. How did he react about your strong feelings about plural marriage? Now that I look back on it, I think he did very well. Though, while I was living it, I seemed to hurt. Not just now and then, but all the time. I couldn't help myself, though I tried Oh, how I tried. But you have forgiven him by now, haven't you? I suppose I have. You had six more children after he went into polygamy and six before, right? 
Yes, I never refused him that way, and I'm glad now that I didn't. Now that it's all over and done with, I love all my children, those that were born after, just as the first ones. They're every bit as dear to me. You have never told me about his death, except that it was very sudden. Yes, very sudden and unexpected. He was working in Salt Lake at the time, and he went in early that day. He ate a good breakfast and rode into the city with one of the neighbors who had a rig. About three hours later, as he was walking along the main street going south, just directly west of the ZCMI on the sidewalk, he was stricken with such severe pain in his abdomen that he fell flat on his face there on the sidewalk. Some men saw his condition and carried him upstairs over the hotel, there on the corner, and a doctor was summoned. His pain grew steadily worse, and the doctor didn't know what to do. They sent a man on horseback to Centerville for me, and I went at once by horse and buggy, but he died before I got there. Afterward, the doctor said it was a strangulated hernia of the intestine, and that it had finally burst. Some thought it was the same as appendicitis, but it wasn't. At that time, there was no known way of operating for it, even had it been diagnosed in time. He died the 28th of April, 1886. It was announced at his funeral that this is the largest funeral ever held in Centerville up until this time. He's buried in Centerville, burial the 2nd of May, 1886. Emmy's first child, Romania, was just six weeks old when he died. And that's it for today's reading. Just two more chapters left and we are finished with her story. And at that point, I'll announce the next reading that we'll be starting based on your feedback from last year. <laughs> so stay tuned for that. And I'll see you next week for chapter 29.